It's a long chapter. Uh, we are not going to take the time to read all of it. There are a few verses that I want us to begin with uh, so that we understand and see um, how Daniel is receiving this vision. It's coming to a close, uh, and he's going to focus upon uh, what it means to uh, have our eyes upon the Lord and what it means to live a, a wise life. So today's title, and for next Sunday as well, Lord willing, uh, A Wise and Christ-Centered Life for 2021, and for today, part one, Lord willing, next week, part two. But if you look with me at chapter 11, verses 33 through 35, and then we're going to read verses chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. But first of all, chapter 11 Verses 33 through 35. And the wise among the people shall make many understand. And we'll see that he is talking about the Lord's people in society. Though for some days they, sh they, the wise, they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, stumble they shall receive a little help. And many shall join themselves to them with flattery, and some of the wise shall stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And at that time... So I want you to see that there's a connection between what Daniel just said. There's a time. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone. Now this is the angel speaking to Daniel. The angel is wrapping things up for Daniel. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So that's the resurrection. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise, those wise people that we just read in chapter 11, verses 33 to 35, and those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, meaning keep it safe. It's true, not, not, not as a secret, but keep this as, a, as the true word. Until the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. If you feel... And if you have felt this past year, and if you still feel that you are in survival mode, then you are not a stranger to Daniel. You're not. Uh, Daniel has lived his entire life in survival mode. They are uh, strangers. Uh, they are aliens. They are captive in Babylon. Uh, he has endured threats of all sorts. You better not pray. We better not catch you outside praying. We better not see you praying. What does he do? He goes up to the window, opens it up, and he prays intentionally so that everyone can see him. He's in survival mode. He's been in, the, in a den of lions, and he's been rescued from it. He has been there as a friend, a close friend to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He has lived his entire life. As everything we know about Daniel, he has lived his, her, his life in survival mode. Survival. I think we'd agree that he's a wise man. He is the administrator, the prefect, uh, head of the wise men uh, under Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he's not lived his life like a fool. He's lived his life like a wise man. This book is for the church. It's for all of us. Uh, not merely to climb up a ladder and be like Daniel, uh, but to see how Daniel lives his life for the Lord and to fix our eyes on the Lord and be wise like he is. 
we are reminded, and we, we've said this several times along the way, that he's the, we would say he's the original magi, uh, the wise man. He's wise. For what reason? And just think about that. Why? If you get to the end of the book of Daniel, he's the original magi. He's a wise man. Why is he wise? Think about it. Mm -hmm. Think about what the world would say, what, what, how, how the world regards wise, wisdom, how to make a lot of money, how to get ahead, how to not get taken advantage of in this life. But here's a wise man, and he's wise because he sees the world as God sees the world. I've been saying that. He sees the world as God sees the world. Through the lens of Scripture, we see the world as God sees the world. We see a world that is in conflict from last week, conflict. There is a spiritual battle going on. If you want to be wise for 2021, Open your eyes to see the world, to see the conflict, to see the spiritual battle that is literally taking place right in front of your eyes. We see it taking place in our hearts. We see it taking place in the world. Let's call this section, verses 2 through 8, Wars and Rumors of Wars. Look with me at God's word again. And now I will show you the truth. So the angel is speaking to Daniel. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has risen, arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. Then the king of the, of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he, and he shall rule, and his authority shall be a great authority. After some years they shall make an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he and his arm shall not endure, but she shall be given up, and her attendants, he who fathered her, and he who supported her in those times. And from a branch from her roots, one shall arise in his place, someone from her family. He shall come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north, and he shall deal with them and shall prevail. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods with their metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold. And for some years he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. Then the latter shall come into the realm of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. Just added one more verse there. Well, what in the world took place back there? Well, I'm going to stick to my notes, and I can pass these on to you if you would like them. These predictions were fulfilled to the letter, so much so that every liberal professor in seminaries all over the planet, all over the planet, says there is no way in the world that Daniel wrote this. Because these events happened hundreds of years after his death, after Daniel's death, and they were fulfilled to the letter. There's no way Daniel could have written this. Had it been written by someone, maybe somewhere around 50, uh, 50 B.C. No way. And the reason why these liberal professors and churches believe that is because they don't believe that God spoke to Daniel with such clarity that he could have written this hundreds of years in advance. There's no way. Why? Because we don't believe that God speaks to a man so clearly. Neither do we believe that God ordains history in such a way that he can tell in advance what's going to happen, that he controls world history like that. We don't believe any of that. What do you believe? 
What do you believe? Around 250 B.C., Ptolemy the second starts with a P, but the P is silent. Ptolemy the second, king of the south, attempted to make peace with Antiochus the second, who was king of the north. How did he attempt to do that? Here's what actually happened. By sending his daughter, Berenice, to marry him. That's within reference to that girl, that girl mentioned in verse 6, that daughter. He sent his daughter, Berenice, to marry him. The plan was that Antiochus would divorce his first wife, Laodice, and disinherit her sons. Laodice discovered the plot, and she had Antiochus and Berenice poisoned, along with their young son. And in the same year, Berenice's father died in Egypt. He was succeeded by Berenice's brother, that is, verse 7, someone from her own family would come up, who then invaded the Seleucid kingdom and conquered its capital, Antioch, exactly as this text predicted. Hundreds of years after Daniel's death. Verses 9 through 34, and I'm not going to read that. I read, did read number, verse 9, but all the way, if you just, just scan your eyes down God's word, all the way to verse 34, and 34 ends with this verse. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help, and many shall join themselves to them with flattery, which we did read earlier. But that entire section, it's, it's repeated over and over and over again. These are the years from verse 9 down to verse 33, 34. These are the years from year 322 down to 163 B.C. And in those verses, there are 13 of the 16 rulers of these two kingdoms of the north and the south, and they are identified in this passage. I'm not going to flesh that out. It's, it would take more than my brain can handle. I will tell you, in John Calvin's commentary on Daniel, he wrote 40 pages just from the comments of verse 9 to 34. 40 pages talking about all those years and all those kingdoms, how Daniel precisely said exactly what was going to take place hundreds of years after him. We could say what? What is all that about? Wars and rumors of wars. It's coming. Daniel is in survival mode, and it's going to get worse. Survival mode. Wars and rumors of wars. Who else said that in the New Testament? Jesus. Yeah, Matthew 24. But these are only what? The beginning of the birth pain. It's exactly what Jesus said. Wars and rumors of wars. So let's break this down like this so we can get through this chapter and have some wonderful application for our hearts. Let's just call this, this section from verses 5 through verse 20, phase 1. Phase 1. Uh, I'm not going to take the time uh, to, to read all of that. Just read some of it. But let's just call this phase 1. Daniel is looking down. He sees the road ahead. It's going to happen after he's long gone. And, and what's happening here is the kingdoms of the north and kingdoms of the south are going to start fighting. Assassinations will take place. Assassination of Seleucus IV took place in 175 B.C. The time of this writing that Daniel is writing is about year 536. And here's what's going to happen. In phase one, wars and rumors of wars, the kingdoms of the north and the kingdoms of the south are going to be fighting. Even... In verses 14 through 16, verses 14 through 16, their own people, the Jews, will get caught up in this. Wars and rumors of wars. I will take the time to read those three verses. Verse 14, in those times many shall rise against the king of the south and the violent among your own people. Daniel, among your own people, the violent among your own people, oh, real J Jews, among your own people shall lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they shall fail. Then the king of the north shall come and throw up siege works and take a, a well-fortified city. And the forces of the, of the south shall not stand or even his best troops, for there shall be no strength to stand. But he who comes against him shall do as he wills, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, Jerusalem, this, this wicked king, 
with destruction in his hand. Jerusalem will be invaded again. In other words, Daniel is seeing it's been invaded, it's been invaded, it's been invaded, and he's looking down the road hundreds of years after him, and Jerusalem is going to be invaded again. It's going to happen over and over and over. We could say this, political powers shift, but conflict remains. Political powers shift, but conflict remains. The conflict never goes away. Which means permanent rest and security will always remain elusive until Jesus comes. Permanent rest and security will remain elusive until Jesus comes. Why? Because Jesus said there will be wars and rumors of wars. So, it begs a couple of questions here. Will the Lord's people cower and fall into unbelief, lose their witness, lose their courage, that, that God is on the throne, that God is sovereign? Daniel doesn't know. He's seeing some things. They're going to survive, but he's now, the angel is telling him, some won't survive, even out of your own people. Will the Lord's people become seduced to using the world's power plays to bring about the kingdom of God? Will we stop praying and start protesting more? Or will the Lord's people wisely keep their eyes on the Lord, in his word, in prayer, and see the world as God sees the world? There will be wars and rumors of wars. Until the end. And Jesus says, see to it that this does not alarm you. See to it that this does not phase you and overwhelm you. Do you realize that your personal existence is part of a larger spiritual conflict? My personal existence, your personal existence is part of a larger spiritual conflict. It's not just about me and my spiritual walk with the Lord. It's about you. It's about the church, the, the, the worldwide, the Catholic, the worldwide universal church. We're part of something much bigger. When your personal existence is caught up in a larger conflict that is beyond your control, how do you respond? When your personal existence is caught up in a larger conflict that is beyond your control, and there's a lot that is beyond our control, how do we respond? I would hope that we would say this all the way through this, this year. Lord, give me courage and hope in you by staying in your word, staying in prayer, keeping, keeping my eyes on Christ who rules and reigns over all. That's the God that Daniel sees. That's the God that I need to see. It's the God that you need to see. Well, phase two, we'll call this next section, phase two with Antiochus the fourth which these years run from 175 to 164 B.C., from chapter 11, verses 21 through 23. I will take the time to read those verses. Verse 21, In his place shall arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant and from the, the time that an alliance is made with him he shall act deceitfully and he shall become strong with a small people this is Antiochus the same one that I spoke to you earlier when we were in chapter 7 Antiochus was a tyrant who forced all of his subjects to adopt Greek cultural and religious practices he banned circumcision in Israel, put an end to sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem in year 167. Then he defiled the temple by burning pig's flesh on the altar and placing an object sacred to Zeus in the Holy of Holies. He burned copies of the scriptures and slaughtered those who remained true to their faith in the Lord. That covenant prince mentioned in verse 22, most commentators believe that it was probably the Jewish high priest 
Onias, O-N-I-A-S, Onias the third. And when he did resist, uh, he was replaced with a more agreeable priest. That's phase two under Antiochus the fourth. Phase three, one greater than Antiochus is coming. And those verses take up verse 36 through the end of the chapter through verse 45. Let's just read a few of them. Let's pick it up at verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished. For what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these. A god whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. But the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land, Jerusalem, and tens of thousands shall fall. But these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction, and he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, Jerusalem, and he shall come to his end with none to help him. Now notice, at that time, I want you to notice the connection of what was just said. And the angel says to Daniel, at that time shall arise Michael. To do what? It's the resurrection. It's the return of Jesus. Wait a minute. Isn't there a lot of time in between Whoever, whoever's coming after Antiochus to the time of the resurrection? Yes, but look what happened. Remember when I said how prophecy works about mountain peaks? It looks like it's just right there. Like you're looking at two mountain peaks. And from a distance, it seems like they're really close to each other. We are in those days before chapter 12 takes place. We are literally right now in those days. So come to an end with no one to help, yet he shall come to his end, but chapter 12, at that time. So I need to say it like this, and we'll do my best here. There is not a clear shift from Antiochus to the future resurrection of chapter 12. There's not. It it seems like they're they're blurred. It's like they're together. It's like they're one and the same. Which means that chapter 11, verse 36, through chapter 12, verse 4, cannot be simply and literally about Antiochus only. There are several things that do fit Antiochus. But the passage as a whole is speaking of a king who will be a larger, more ultimate version of Antiochus that will be alive at the return of Christ. The New Testament calls him the Antichrist. And specifically, verses 40 through 45 don't really match Antiochus' life at the end. It doesn't. Antiochus died in a minor campaign against Persia in year 164 B.C., not between the sea and Jerusalem. It's not where he died. I think we should take this passage the same way we take Matthew chapter 24 when Jesus taught. 
I think there's a dual fulfillment, a dual fulfillment taking place. When you read Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus says that the desolation that is coming, the abomination of desolation, but you must persevere, endure to the end, because these are the beginning of birth pains. And then he says in verse 30, almost I think it's verse 31, and after the days of that tribulation, then the worst will hit. So what's Jesus doing there? Most commentators are, are, are in total agreement that there's a dual fulfillment taking place in Matthew 24. What is that dual fulfillment? That A.D. 70 would take place. What's so special about A.D. 70? It's exactly what Jesus said. The armies will come in. Let him who is on the house top, house top, there's not enough time. They're coming in. Rome came in. They burned the city down. They tore the walls down. They tore the temple down. They did not leave one stone upon another. And yet, Matthew 24 is saying more than that. Why? Because we're still here. <laughs> we're still here. His return at the end of that section has not taken place, where he sends his angel and the trumpet is blown, and he gathers his people out of the four corners of the earth. The resurrection hasn't taken place. I think if we need to see Daniel here doing the same thing, the angel is giving him a fulfillment, a prophecy, but it's a dual fulfillment. Some things will take place in the near future, of Daniel's near future, but we're still here. And the prince, Michael, has not come. And we are not yet resurrected. But it's all sandwiched together. So, how shall we now live 2021, in the words of Francis Schaeffer, with a wise and Christ-centered life. Let's look at the text again. Number one, believe and know that God is God. Look at verse 32. Believe and know that God is God. Chapter 11, verse 32. And it's implied, he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Aren't you glad when you open up Matthew and Luke that Zechariah and Elizabeth are living for the Lord? Ananias, the prophetess, Simeon, the priest. There's a remnant. They stood firm. They stood firm. Why? First of all, verse 32, it's implied. But the people who know their God, right there, that's it. They know their God. Believe and know that God is God. What am I trying to say again? Gain a, a biblical perspective upon world history. World history. See it as God sees it. And believe that, that he's there. As Francis Schaeffer did say, he is there and he is not silent. He's speaking. He's at work. Don't believe in God the way Thomas Jefferson did. Have you, ever, have you ever had a conversation with someone and, and they talk like that they believe that there's a God? Don't get suckered in by thinking that they believe what you believe just because they say they believe in God. A lot of people believe in God. Thomas Jefferson said he believed in God. But Thomas Jefferson denied Jesus Christ. They're called deists. You have a lot of people, I have a lot of people in my circle of friendships and family that will use God language and say they believe in God. But not the way you're called to believe in God. Believe and know that God is God. Most people believe that God is like a clockmaker after having made the clock, winds it up, and leaves it to itself to tick-tock its way through time, unattended and unintentional, other than just you tick-tock and tick-tock. There's no purpose. And he's definitely not personal. The truth is, history is more than just the jousting of kings and kingdoms. It is not just the passing off of one king and another pope for another king and another pope and another king and another pope. No, world history is the scrupulous 
purposeful, targeted objective of displaying the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is all headed to display Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the very verse that we've been reciting at the beginning of every single worship service, Daniel 2.44. A king is coming, and all the other kings and all the kingdoms are going to go away. You have got to believe in the God that does exist and who sent his son. All this year long, it's an amazing thing that God would take millennia to prove that there is no other true king than his son. It's it's like saying to the world, you will never, ever get it right. And I'll prove it to you. Tick. Talk, tick, talk, and you will never, ever get it right. Never, ever, ever get it right. You know how long 60 seconds is? It's maddening. 60 seconds is an unbelievable long time when you're just trying to stay quiet. How many seconds have been tick talking? Since Daniel's day. And Daniel's going. The God of Daniel's going. You will never ever get it right. Never ever get it right. Never ever ever get it right. Until my son comes. Until my son comes. This is the God you must believe and know. It's that God. Secondly, there in verse 32, people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. So for 2021, we not only believe and know this God, but we stand firm and take action. In the days of Antiochus, some among God's people would be seduced or pressured to going over to the dark side. Verse 31. But those who stand firm and take action will not abandon the Lord nor his gospel. Verses 32 and 33. And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame by captivity and plunder. Some will fall by the sword or be burned or be captured or be plundered. In other words, obedience to God can and will mean a lifetime of faithfulness in a hostile environment. Is God able to save from lions and an overheated furnace? Yes. But the norm is that there is no miracle rescue at the end for believers all across human history. Which means it is foolish to live your life for Christ if There is no resurrection. If chapter 12 isn't true, when we are raised from the dead, it would be foolish to live our lives at such cost. To your family and friends who do not really believe that God is God over all human history to magnify Christ, your life looks foolish. You are a fool for standing firm for a fairy tale in their eyes. But God says that that it is the wise who live their lives at great cost. Verse 35, and some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end. In other words, this is wisdom, folks. This is wisdom. Matthew 10, 28 says, do not be afraid, where Jesus was speaking. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. If world history is just the tick-tock of time with no real purpose behind it other than just tick-tocking, then faithful suffering for Christ and his gospel is foolish. Yep, it's a wasted life. And we should just be pursuing our personal and private affluence, as what Francis Schaeffer said, 
my personal peace and affluency at any cost, as the phrase goes, get all you can while you can and can all you can get. (laughs) What a pitiful existence to live for Christ and suffer the consequences when there is no real judgment and no real God who will send his son again to judge the world and gather his saints. But we stand firm with the saints in scripture and throughout world history and we take action to live our lives for Christ at whatever cost God chooses for us and we say along with Jim Elliot who was speared to death by the Aka Indians in South America just before his martyrdom when he was at Wheaton College he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose Amen. that's the kind of people we need to be we stand firm and take action So we believe and know that God is God. We stand firm and take action. What else? How about teach? Look at verse 33. Teach. And the wise among the people shall make many understand. Make many understand. So good news is coming, Daniel. People are going to spring up. I'm going to raise up people. And they're going to teach God's word. How else did Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph And Ananias and Simeon show up in Matthew chapter 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 1 and 2. Where did they they get this knowledge? God kept his remnant alive. And we're to do the same. Teach. Teach God's word. Without the instruction of God's word and sound application, the church will just drift into being shaped by the culture in which it lives. Again, I don't mean to keep bringing up Francis Schaeffer. But in one of his books, he said, if you want to see where the average church will be seven years from now, just look at at the world today, because that's where the church is going to be seven years from now. And unfortunately, that is true. Unfortunately, that is so true. Why? Because churches don't want to stand against the wind or against the tide. I remember the strongest tide that I've ever, ever, ever experienced. And it was in, uh, where did we go last year? Oahu. There's a section. It's like a cul-de-sac. And the mountains is huge. And the ocean just just hammers that section. And it's one of the most favorite spots to go swimming. And it's one of the most dangerous on the, on the island. It will, it will, it could throw you against a rock. Here it comes. And the force is unbelievable. I can only barely stand about getting about this high in it. And, and, it's, and after about 10 minutes of dealing with that, you're exhausted, just exhausted. It'd be a whole lot easier to just turn around and just go with it, wouldn't it? It'd be a whole lot easier to say things like, you know, this is just man's opinion. Do you realize there are churches all over Kendall County that treat this book no more than that? It's man's opinion. And they're gathering. They're, they call themselves churches. No more than man's opinion. Why? Because it's easier to just simply say what the world says about this book. That it has no authority, real authority over our lives. But we must keep on teaching. We must keep on teaching. So that the church will not lose its perspective upon ultimate realities. Upon ultimate realities. Think about this, folks. How much conversation takes place during the week on foolish, temporal, trivial, dust in the wind with no eternal perspective type of conversations? It's incredible. Parents, how many times during the week do you engage your children with an eternal perspective? That there is a God in heaven who sent his son and one day he's coming back. Eternal perspectives. So, finally, something that's not actually not specifically mentioned in this text. Pray. Pray. I want to hold on to the God who is real. I want to believe in him and know him. 
I want to take a stand. I want to do what I can to inform others, teaching others, and then pray. Chapter 8, as you remember, his invocation of who God is, his confession of sin, his plea for mercy and strength. In fact, all this section right here, all of it is, is like um, sandwiched in between a prayer. It's the prayer that has created all of this, that prayer, that long, wonderful prayer in chapter 8. Chapters 9 through 12 is the vision, of course, but it's premised upon Daniel's prayer. It's a response to Daniel's praying. Daniel, you prayed, you prayed, you are dearly beloved, we've heard your prayers, and now we have this for you. Every bit of this is flowing out of Daniel's prayer. Daniel's prayer. Daniel is praying his way through the tumult. He is. Um... This past weekend, um, we got out DVDs uh, that re- were, were recorded quite some time ago that I haven't seen. Uh, I haven't seen in 21 years. Uh, we got one DVD out and uh, that Jeff Nix pulled off of a 8 millimeter or whatever it was in those days, camcorder, put it on DVD, and uh, it came on. We're watching it, and the date uh, is December 1999. December 1999. Joshua was 13 years old, and then uh, it got to a point where we're a recording of uh, Christmas, Christmas 1999, and Joshua was 13, Ashley was 11, and Anna was five, six, something like that. I don't know. Anyway, something like that. And, uh, and it was really special. I went, wow, wow. This is incredible. And the years have gone by, just re- reflecting on it. And then I made a comment that Y2K is coming in just a few days, and we're all going to die. <laughs> Joshua got up, and he does, and he starts acting like a zombie. And we're all going to run down because the computers are going to crash, and we're all computers anyway. And he's now doing this in the video. And then and he falls over to the floor. It's hilarious. And uh, if you remember in those days, Y2K. And then the movie goes on, and all of a sudden it's my family. I haven't seen this in 21 years. Where are we? We're, We're at Calvary Baptist Church, the fellowship hall. There's Dad. There's my Uncle Bobby. Oh, this this is a family reunion. And then as it went on, this is not a family reunion. Everyone's dressed up. Aunt Sharon, Aunt Shirley, all my cousins. Oh, then it hit me. This is Grandma's funeral. Dad's mom. It's the reception after the funeral back at Calvary Baptist Church. We buried her over in Clay County where she was, where she was raised and where Dad was raised. Um, and then after it was over with, watched it all, I started reflecting. Wow, 21 years ago, Aunt Sharon, she's no longer with us. Dad's next older sister. Uncle Bobby, dad's youngest brother, Uncle Bobby's not with us. Died of Agent Orange because of Vietnam. Hmm. Aunt Connie's not with us. Well, oh, she's gone too. Dad's not with us. Wow. Now the only three people left is Aunt Shirley, Aunt Vicki, and Uncle Ronnie. Wow. And several cousins. No longer here either. Hmm. I wonder if I'll be here this time next year. Any guarantees? How about you? Do you know your God? Do you want to know him even more? 
Are you going to stand firm and take action? As the, as the world pushes harder against you? Are you going to do what you can to spread the gospel? Teach, instruct, talk about the Lord, especially when it's inconvenient. Because is there ever a convenient time to talk about the Lord to lost people? Is there? Uh, no, it's, it's sometimes, maybe, but not too many. And then are you going to pray this year? Daniel prayed, and he was rewarded. The Lord answers prayers. The Lord answers prayers. We're going to pray this year. We're going to pray more. And I want to. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I know that. But these are the things that I want. These are the things that I want for you this year. Time goes on. We lose our family members and we lose our friends. But there's a resurrection coming. Chapter 12. There's a resurrection coming. And I can't wait to see Uncle Bobby, Aunt Sharon, my dad, my grandma, other family members that have known the Lord. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, um, there's an old saying, all good things must come to an end. And when I watch a movie like that, yeah, a lot of good things came to an end. And it breaks my heart. But I think we ought to adopt a, a better saying. All bad things will come to an end. All bad things will come to an end one day. That's what Daniel sees. That's what we need to see. So that we don't lose heart. I pray, Heavenly Father, as by your good mercies and grace, we wrap up the book of Daniel next week. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll help us to have a vision that Daniel had, have a vision of you, to could see you more clearly, and you would sustain our faith. In Christ's name we pray, amen.